A Critique of Interventionism by Ludwig von Mises Chapter 3. Social Liberalism Part 8. Max Weber and the Socialists of the Chair The opposition that arose in Germany against the Socialists of the Chair generally started with an awareness that theoretical investigations of economic problems are essential. As economists Detzel, Julius Wolff, Ehrenberg, Povel, Adolf Weber, Passau, and others rose against the Socialists of the Chair, on the other hand, historians raise objections against the manner in which Schmoller, Knapp, and his pupils sought to solve historical tasks. Equipped with the tools of their sciences, these critics approached the doctrines of the socialists of the chair from the outside. Of course, the socialists of the chair, with their great prestige and important positions, made it difficult for the critics, but the encounter presented no problem of conscience to them. They either had never been under the spell of socialism or had freed themselves from it without difficulty. It was quite different with Max Weber. To the younger Max Weber, the ideas of Prussian editism and socialism of the chair and evangelical social reform had meant everything. He had absorbed them before he had begun to deal scientifically with the problems of socialism. Religious, political, and ethical considerations had determined his position. Max Weber's university training was in law. His early scientific works dealt with legal history. He began as an unsalaried lecturer and became a professor of law. His inclination was for history, not the historical research of particulars that is lost in detail and overlooks the whole but universal history, historical synthesis, and the philosophy of history. To him, history was no goal in itself, but a means toward gaining more profound political insight. Economics was alien to him. He was appointed professor of economics without having dealt with this science before, which was customary procedure at that time. It reflected the empirical realistic school's opinion on the nature of social sciences and on the scientific expertise of legal historians. Just before his untimely death, Weber regretted that his knowledge of modern theoretical economics and classical system was too limited. He mentioned his fear that time would not permit him to fill these regrettable gaps. When he accepted the position, he was obliged to give lectures on those problems which the socialists of the chair considered the proper subject matter for university teaching. But Weber found no satisfaction in the prevailing doctrine. The jurist and historian in him rebelled against the manner in which the school treated legal and historical problems. This is why he began pioneering methodological and epistemological investigations. It led him to the problems of materialistic philosophy of history, from which he then approached the religious sociological tasks. He proceeded finally to a grandiose attempt at a system of social sciences, but all these studies step by step led Max Weber away from the political and social ideals of his youth. He moved for the first time toward liberalism, rationalism, utilitarianism. It was a painful personal experience, not different from that of many other scholars breaking away from Christianity. Indeed, his faith and religion were Prussian edictism. Breaking away from it was like the desertion from hope his own people, indeed, from European civilization. As it became clear to him that the prevailing social ideology was untenable, and as he saw where it was bound to lead, he began to see the future of the German nation and the other nations that carry European civilization. In a way, as the nightmare of coalitions deprived Bismarck of his sleep, so the recognition to which his studies led him gave Weber no rest. No matter how he clung to the hope that everything would work out in the end, the dark premonition told him again and again that a catastrophe was approaching. This awareness gnawed at his health, filled him with the growing uneasiness after the outbreak of the World War, urged him on to activity, for a man unwanted by any of the political parties had to remain fruitless, and finally hastened his death. From its beginning in Heidelberg, the life of Max Weber was an uninterrupted inner struggle against the doctrines of the socialism of the chair. But he did not fight the struggle to the end. He died before he succeeded in completely freeing himself from the spell of these doctrines. He died lonely, without intellectual heirs, who could continue the fight he had to give up in death. To be sure, his name is praised, but the true substance of his work is not recognized, and that which was most important to him has found no disciples. Only opponents have recognized the dangers in their own ideology from the thoughts of Max Weber.